Greetings everyone and welcome back to 365 Days of Prague. Now before I tell you what we're gonna do today, I'm gonna first start off with the fact that this is gonna be a really, okay, not a really, but it's gonna be a long episode. And this is because we're listening to a long and eventful album. Yes, today we are listening to Aphrodite's Child. The album is 666. Hi, my name's Naomi. I'm an avid progressive rock fan, but I'm a long ways from knowing all the prog albums out there. But this year, I'm gonna give it a try. This is 365 Days of Prog. So, as I said, this is going to be a long episode, and one of the things that's going to open up this one is my favorite bits from the album. Now, I'm gonna leave you all for quite a while as you listen to all of the gatherings that I came up in this album that I really really like. So I hope you enjoy it and I'll see you all in like a minute, a minute and a half. Enjoy. first have to start off my review of this album in saying that this is definitely the most exquisite and unique album I've heard on this list so far. I don't think we've heard anything like this before and if you've not given this album a listen, I guess my introduction and the way I review it will probably make you at least go and have it a try and believe me it is very very different and unique. The only way and the best way I think I can describe this uniqueness is by comparing it to languages, for example. So you might have a language like, let's say, Italian and Spanish, which they both come from the same base of language, like the same origin language, but they've diverged into two separate languages. Although if you do take a Spanish speaker and let him hear an Italian person speaking and vice versa, they will manage to understand and take a glimpse of some things and this is exactly what this album is. Now you're probably asking yourself how is that like you know comparable. I find this album to be the product of a band or band members who were told everything about prog and what prog is but never got the chance to actually listen to any prog and then they were led to record some prog and I think this is what makes this album so unique. It sounds like what the idea of Prague is. One thing I really, really like about this album, I actually really, really like it, is the fact that they chose to make it an English album. They, you know, it's sung and it is in English, although the band themselves are from Greece. But the really cool thing is that they kept their Greek, you know, identity inside the album. The uniqueness of the album is also because it has a sound which no other band, or at least no, not a lot of other prog bands have really tried before, which is the Greek sound. So you've got all of those French bands and you've got the German bands and you've got, you know, the USA and Britain, but you don't really see a lot of that, you know, Southern Europe kind of influences in prog. And that's already amplified by the fact that whilst recording this album, the bandmates, they were not actually in Greece itself. They were actually recording it in France because at the time the rule in Greece did not really look favorably towards rock music and there was an uprising if I'm not mistaken 
and they had to be outside the country and away from their home, only keeping their traditions and their sound in the album they've made. Now there's a lot to talk about this album and I know the band members, the two people mainly focused on making this album, were pretty, you know, controversial in the scene, at least of Prague. Uh, they made some really, really cringing music at the time, let's say, and this was a really, really odd change of pace. Now looking at their solo work, you probably wouldn't like what you got, but this album in particular is something really, really different and really unique that they've made up and is really their magnum opus. So I'll stop jibber jabbing about the idea and the concept and what I think of that. I'm gonna talk about the album itself. So the concept of this album is really, really unique. It's really, really inspired by the biblical stories and biblical ideas. And the idea is basically that there's a circus show going on which depicts the apocalypse, you know, the biblical apocalypse, while the actual apocalypse is occurring outside. And the entire album is basically the merging of those two into one cohesive, you know, timeline and narrative. I said timeline, didn't I? Ah, uh, yeah, totally meant timeline. And I find that concept and the way it's executed to be really, really ferocious. It's really, really all in. And I love the idea of the satanic and demonic, you know, narrative of this album and the way the world is ending and all the gospel that's gotten into this music. So I tried to summarize this album and conceptually, at least in one sentence. And I think the best way to describe it is the idea of carnival, the inspiration of Sgt. Pepper and the execution of the wall. And you can see all of that in many different places. The idea of the circus being performing a show in a, you know, this dystopian world really does hinder to Karn Evil, the way that ELP made it. And the opening tune of Babylon really does sound like a demonic or at least like a maniac version of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Just give it a listen, you'll know what I'm talking about right away. And of course, the giant rock ballad of, you know, the two sides, the four sides actually, is very similar to The Wall by Pink Floyd. And of course, if I didn't mention it yet, it's pretty obvious this is, if not, one of the greatest prog concept albums. So when it comes to the music itself on the album, it's really all over the place. You get some things which you've never heard on any other album, I assure you that. You get a lot of spoken word and you get a lot of, you know, biblical references and it all feels like you're in some sort of this grandiose ceremony being held by the band themselves. And yes, this album does actually stir into absurdity many, many times with a lot of different songs and ideas. And I find myself kind of liking that absurd sign because it really reminded me of a least known album, at least not known by a lot of people, called Imaginarium Songs from the Neverhood. Here's the cover of it right here. Uh, it's from a video game which I really really love and I've always loved this game and it just has the most bizarre music ever and I think listening to that album as a kid really really brought me you know some confidence in listening to this type of odd and absurd music. So another thing about this album the production of it is really or at least was really 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 expensive. If I'm not mistaken, the band themselves, they've spent around about, I think, 80,000 to 90,000 US dollars on the production of this album. And if you know your sums, you know that this is a lot of money. But I think this album really justifies all of that. I don't think we've listened to an album with such a high production value as this one so far. They've used everything in their abilities to get their point across in this album. And I think it's really, really mesmerizing and amazing what they've done. From the mixing to the production to the stellar usage of stereo audio on this album, I find that the production on this album is really a key part of what makes it good. And speaking of production value, there is one song which is really controversial on here, which I think has a great, great mix when it comes to stereo, and that's the Infinity Symbol song. Now, the fact is, this song has a name which is not usually able to be written, because the name itself is literally the Infinity Symbol. And another reason that this song is controversial, and I think this is the main reason why it is, is because it features the, I think, Greek actress Irene Papas getting a psychedelic orgasm. And trust me, it is audible and you can really hear it. And it's a great song, don't get me wrong. I think it's really, really good. It's just really controversial and I'm really surprised that it got through the, the record label. Now, considering the fact that at the time, record labels did not want to, you know, 
let out Mike Oldfield's tubular bells because it did not have singing on it is really quite astonishing to see that they actually got this through the record label of their own. I'm just gonna end this off saying that if you want to listen to that song and you should, I'd describe it as being very vigorous. Another thing I really love about this album is the usage of spoken word. I don't think we get a lot of albums that do that, at least not as a motive. It sometimes appears here and there, but usually it's not a very, you, you know, usual thing to do in prog music. But this album, it really tries to emphasize the idea that it's all biblical and everything is basically preaching to the listener and thus spoken word and actual like people talking and not singing at all in this album is a really prominent part. And you can find it on many songs and I think the best usage of it comes on the... Don't get me wrong, I think it's the third track called Loud 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 which is a really, really lovely one. It just is so immersing. You listen to it and you gotta feel something whilst listening to it because it is executed in such a way when you're in the mood, you're inside the idea of the album, you're already flowing in it, although it just begun. And I love the way that this album opens up and uses that spoken word mentality to its advantage. One of the best, I think, and most unique songs on this album has to be All The Seats Were Occupied. Now, that song is by far the longest piece on this uh, album. It counts in, I think, at 19 minutes or so, and it's basically a reprise of the entire album. Now, usually when you get a reprise song on an album, it usually focuses on one song that came before it on the album itself, and it just, you know, reprises it in some way to make itself you know, closed. It gives closure to an album. A great example, and it's one of the inspirations for this one, is of course Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, when you have the first song and then you have the reprise of it at the end, and it really does give that sense of conclusion. But what makes this one unique is the fact that it reprises all the songs on this album. It just goes on, it's very atmospheric, and there is a lot of, you know, motives and actual recordings from other songs just strewn into it, and in that way you feel like you've gone through an entire journey of the apocalyptic journey to reach the point you're in. And one thing I really really like about this is the fact that they decided not to make that the last album. Again, another thing very very much like Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. They decided to include one last song after the, that reprise and that song is called Break which literally gives you a break from this album and sends you back you know, to your normal word to hear where we all are. And I think a song like that is really, really needed in the case of this album because you get so immersed and you get so strewn into the entire narrative of this album, you really need something to lay you back outside of this experience. So although All The Seats Were Occupied and Break are great songs, I have to say that my favorite song in this album is, well, it's complicated. You see, I actually have three favorites off this album, which I can't really decide which one I like the most. The first one being the song The Beast. I find it to be so fun all the way through. I'm just really enjoying it. It's really wacky. It sounds like that Imaginarium album I told you about before. I really think it's a great, great song. And actually this song is the only one I gave it a full 10 out of 10, which is saying a lot. Now, the reason I'm not saying that it is my favorite song in this album is there are two other songs which want to take that candidacy. Another song which I think to be my favorite is, of course, The Four Horsemen. And yes, I know, I think it's probably the most popular song that the band themselves actually made ever, and for a good reason. It's really groovy, it's really good, it's really rocky, it's hard-hitting, and it has some fantastic guitar solos. But I do not really, really dig the first section of, you know, the somber singing, the very, very light and quiet singing. I think it's good and I can appreciate it by all means, but it doesn't really pump it up to the 10 it could have been. Still, I really, really enjoy it. But the last song, which I think would have been my favorite if for not one fatal flaw, would have been the second track called Babylon. I completely, completely astonishingly love this track. I think it's amazing. I love the chord progression, I love the vibe, I love the energy, I love everything about that track. 
but one thing that literally drives me crazy every single time I've listened to it since hearing it the first time is the fact that the mixing on their singing is so non-balanced. You literally, the words themselves, they just get, you know, sunk into the music itself. You can't really hear what they're saying. And I assure you, if you're not listening to this with lyrics open, you're not going to understand what they're saying because it's so quiet and just within the music itself. And I believe that if this song just had a bit of amplification on the singing itself, this would have been, by a long shot, the best song of this album. So yeah, what are we gonna do? I don't know. I love this one. I love every single song on this album, but there are three which I find to be the best and I cannot choose one. And before we end off and actually go on to the cover, I want to tell you something really, really funny about this album. So apparently on the gatefold for this album, you actually get this inscription. This album was recorded under the influence of Sothleb. And if you do not know what Sothleb is, it's basically a Greek dessert, which is made, I think, out of corn flour and uh, milk, if I'm not mistaken. And I've had it a few times and it's really, really good and I like it very much. But I think the fact that they decided to put that in is just so funny, so hilarious, and it kind of makes the fun about the fact that a lot of albums at the time were made under the influence of drugs, basically. Or maybe I'm just taking it too far, I don't know, but I found that to be like really, really humorous. So whilst reading, I found out that this album cover is inspired by the Beatles' White album cover. Now, I kind of get where they're coming from. I understand the idea of having that solid color all throughout the album to really make that, you know, stance. This by itself is a fantastic, fantastic, fantastic cover. I think it really emphasizes what this album is all about. It just screams out, yeah, this is the apocalypse. This is the devil's number. We're putting it like a highway sign right on our cover. But something about it really, really does look modernized and I don't know, I have no idea, but it just emphasizes everything. I love this cover, like I really do love this cover and I can't really tell you exactly why it just is the perfect cover for this album so how much would i rate this album well this album receives the most splendid 9 out of 10. why is it a 9 out of 10 and not a 10 out of 10 well the fact is that most of the songs in this album are enjoyable in the context of the album itself so listening to a lot of them you know as a standalone tracks is not really that good but when listening to the entire experience of this album it just works and it works fantastically so it basically shot itself in the leg it is good because of its context and it's amazing because of its context but it's not getting a 10 because out of context this album is a little wonky so that's about it definitely my longest video yet on the channel and for a good reason i think this album is a fantastic album and it totally deserved this time and i'm sure i'm gonna have some fun editing this later so stay tuned for tomorrow where we'll be listening to the album anchor shispa by the band koenji hayake yeah i know that's a mouthful it's gonna be a blast i truly believe so but until then, have a great, great day, and I'll see you all tomorrow. Bye, guys.